Hi everyone and welcome to this webinar. Today we're going to be talking about automating ETH authorization policy using Envoy metrics with a declarative approach. So this talk is going to be focused on security, um, in particular network security for cloud native environment. And we're going to take a look at different principles that help uh, improve security posture with developers at the center of everything. And we're going to also answer to this uh, question, why do we want to start with developers? So let's get started. My name is Nick. I'm the head of developer relations at Authorize. At Authorize, um, we aim at building products and open source projects focused on uh, the automation of the control of identity and access management policies for workloads. And we're going to see a lot of uh, things, a lot of principles that uh, we apply to facilitate the life of you know, different persona within different teams like uh, platform engineering, uh, security engineers, and of course, developers. So a bit more about me. I enjoy coding phone apps. I love DevOps and automation tools. Uh, if you want to connect with me, probably the best way to do it as a really an avid distance runner would be to connect uh, with me on Strava directly. Anyway, so let's get started. So why do we want to put developers uh, in the center of security? Well, if you think about it, traditionally, let's say if you're a developer for iOS or Android, you're already defining you know, in a declarative fashion what features you want to access from your phone. So on the screen here, uh, this is a typical uh, example on, um, of an info.p list where the developers specify the capabilities uh, they want to use for uh, the program. So here we can see um, the processor, the GPS, location services, Wi-Fi, etc., etc. So if we extend this principle to security, well, it would be very easy for a developer to specify a list of calls they need to make to make an application work. And then we could build a solution that can automate the low level details for um, those calls to happen, to happen, you know, whether it's microservices, whether it's in the cloud, whether you need to access a, to a database, a serverless function, uh, then using this principle, we could just automate what developers need. And this is the idea of what we're going to see uh, around uh, intent-based access control and all the features that I'm going to mention uh, with, uh, with Authorize. But first, let's check uh, what problem we are trying to solve here. What are we trying to achieve? So before the adoption of cloud and you know, cloud-native environment, we used to have a tiered model for network security where it was essentially based on um, perimeter security. So you had east-west traffic that was secured by some firewall, and then north-south traffic that can be secured by other type of firewall. And there, were, there was a clear distinction between what was considered you know, within the boundary of the data center and what was outside of the data center. Uh, but with the adoption of uh, hyperscalers like Azure, Google, or you know, AWS, then those lines, those perimeters get a lot more um, blurred, right? So it means that this old model is not efficient anymore, right? So this is not applicable in today's environment. And on top of that, you have uh, advanced threat nowadays, especially with the adoption of uh, artificial intelligence. So we need to better protect uh, our workloads and do things like prevent lateral movement, uh, reduce and decrease the blast radius in case, in case of, uh, you know, if uh, workloads get, uh, get compromised. So all of that led the industry to start talking about what we call zero trust. So a zero trust model um, uh, or security model is a model where every workload is considered as if it was, you know, um, outside of the data center in this old model. So there is no more like you can trust a workload because it's inside the data center. Any workload, any traffic is considered the same. There is no more you know, perimeter that is clearly defined. And for that, we need to do a couple of things. So of course, it all starts with micro segmentation. 
right? Because we can't base this, the security model on perimeter. So we have to define much more reduced and, uh, and smaller zones or micro segment. Typically, you will find like a distributed firewall that is protecting uh, the workloads the closest possible to them. So can be software agent or distributed software within um, particular networking equipment, these kind of things. But it's not enough, right? Because just doing this, we are ignoring two main components of zero trust. Uh, which are authorization and authentication. So to adhere to a zero trust, um, to, to zero trust principle, you need the ability to you know, prevent unwanted traffic, but also every workload should be able to be, um, to have, must have an identity and also must have a clear list of things uh, the workload can do. So basically authentication, and authorization. But uh, why do we need to do that change, right? Because of course we're not doing it for the sake of for the sake of it. We need to do it because if we don't do so, in case of, of compromission because of this advanced technique, you know we've seen ransomware and all other uh, advanced threats then it's going to cost a lot of money. And here we have a quote from Cybersecurity Ventures, which said that um, the, the cybercrime damage costs will grow by 15% per year over the next three years, reaching, reaching $10.5 trillion of dollar annually by 2025, right? up from $3 trillion back in 2015. So that's basically multiplied by more than three, right? So this is a valid reason why we need to implement those changes. Uh, but I would say uh, it's not necessarily enough. We need also other solutions for microservices, which are much more dynamic uh, in nature. That's what I've just showed you before. And um, today we got, as I said, we're going to take a look at Istio. So Istio. Um, is combining some of the component, uh, uh, some of the components I've just just mentioned. So first of all, Istio allows you to um, integrate a firewall on top of every service. So you can say service A can talk to service B on that particular HTTP uh, for that particular HTTP resource. This kind of thing. So you can go up to layer seven, which is much more, uh, you know, robust. Uh, especially for services uh, at the application layer than typical uh, layer three, layer four firewalls, right? That's the first thing. It's very dynamic because it's there uh, when the service gets deployed. There's no delay between the moment you deploy the service and the moment the service is secure. Right? Everything is defined as a single entity. And then secondly, Istio also implements mutual TLS, which is a way to identify every service uh, within the Istio service mesh. So as you can see, Istio represents a mesh of service that provides things like service discovery, uh, security, MTLS, and that is using a proxy, so which is the Envoy proxy, to uh, implement these uh, security mechanisms. However, with Istio, there is another parameter to take into account, is that Istio is not necessarily super easy to grasp. So we need to find a way to make uh, Istio more accessible for platform engineers in, um, in general and Kubernetes engineers as well. And we're going to see how Authorize can uh, help you do that. But um, additionally, this is another change. We need to make things easier in Kubernetes. Uh, because obviously here, as you can see from uh, Red Hat 2023, quote, over 50% of organizations report misconfigurations as their top security concern in Kubernetes, right? So this is a very important part. We need to make anything related to security uh, more accessible, uh, e more you know, easily configurable and manageable, um, especially at scale within Kubernetes. And then on top of that, we can find 94% of organizations uh, that have experienced at least one community security incident in the past year. Right? So it's even more important to insist on those security features. Uh, of course, Istio is just one of them, but there are so many. 
uh, but of course the talk is going to be centered uh, on Istio today. So one of the questions now becomes how to solve these security challenges in cloud native environment and also solve um, you know, the inconsistency you can sometimes find between what you have in testing or staging environment uh, and what you have into the production environment and um, also the inconsistency between what you have deployed in production, the, config, the security configuration that is deployed in production and the expectations of uh, the security team. So one of the solution uh, you should implement to facilitate that is shift left security. So shift left security means that you are bringing security configuration and security uh, principle earlier into the development cycle, which means closer to the developer. And to manage this, we need to involve every team that is responsible to run workloads in production. More particularly, we need to facilitate the communications between the different teams involved so that even though it starts with the developer, but their input can then be used by other teams to build uh, other components around this security configuration. So this, start, this starts with the infrastructure team, or let's call it the platform engineering team. They are still obviously responsible for identity and access management, making sure that least privileged principles are applied into the environment. And uh, they do this so that the attack surface and the blast reduced uh, can be uh, decreased. Also prevent lateral movement with the end goal of ensuring that zero trust is uh, enforced within the environment. Then we have the engineering team essentially the developers, they also need to make sure that security is built in into their code, as well as making sure supply chain security uh, is applied, continuous integration pipelines, we need also some security applied here. And of course, credentials management, preferably use short-lived credentials for every resource they need. And then last but not least, we have the security team with a broader vision um, of security for the company and broader vision in terms of compliance, uh, adaptability. So depending on you know, new threats or new industry threats, they implement new compliance policies that needs then to be applied and deployed by uh, the rest of the team. They need to make sure of the root of trust, things like public key infrastructure, uh, we also mentioned, you know, mutual TLS, so mutual authentication uh, for workloads, making sure that there is proper authorization and authentication in place, and also have, you know, a good response time uh, in place for their blue team, things like uh, mean time to detection and uh, mean time to response are really key metrics that security teams uh, needs to, um, you know, improve and that is depending on the whole chain of security and um, the ability to coordinate between those three different teams. This is where IBAC comes in, or Intent-Based Access Control. So IBAC is a concept that aims to simplify and automate the management of access policies in distributed environments, such as hyperscaler or cloud-native ecosystems. So the idea is to provide a decorative way for developer to specify uh, the list of calls they need to make to make the application work in the same way that we've seen um, you know, earlier how Android or Apple developers could specify the list of um, you know, device capabilities they needed with this, within this uh, info.plist file. And this is made possible, so IBAC is made possible via a custom resource definition in Kubernetes. So a YAML file that is called a client intent. And there are two ways to work with client intent. So the first one, which I just mentioned, is by manually um, creating the file and specifying the different calls that uh, a particular service needs to make 
to get access to the resources uh, it needs. So for example, here you can see that uh, the checkout service needs to access the email service. And then depending on the environment where um, this policy is applied, then uh, Authorize can configure different lower level policies. And the second uh, methodology in terms of um, you know, deploying the client intent into your uh, Kubernetes cluster for automation is by uh, detecting the traffic from that application using eBPF. So what that means is that you can also automatically generate uh, those client intents based on actual traffic. So let's take uh, an example. So here we have two services, the analysis service that needs to access the database or DB service. Uh, those are two services running into Kubernetes. And on top of that, we also have an extra uh, integration, authorized integration uh, with the database that will allow us to control uh, extra, you know, extra permission for that database. So let's take a look at what sort of client intent we can create uh, to make the analysis service talk to the database and apply more granular um, policies on top of that. So first, um, again, the client intent is focused around uh, the client from the client view, right? So here in the uh, spec uh, part, we're going to specify what is the calling service. So we are uh, calling from analysis service, we are calling DB, right? So we just specify name DB. If we just specify that particular uh, line, then automatically authorize is going to trigger uh, the creation of a Kubernetes native network policy, which means that any CNI that is you know, capable of uh, enforcing network policies uh, will have a network policy created by authorize. And then we also have a second line here um, that will allow us to specify extra permissions that we allow from the analysis service to the database. So in terms of the type, this is of type database. We specify the database name, uh, which is here ODA. Uh, we can also specify a table, um, particular table. So here it's public.analysis. You can uh, omit table and then it's going to be valid for the entire database or all the tables within that database. And we can then specify a list of operations that we only want to allow. So in that particular case, we just want to allow select, insert and update. And as we do that, the analysis service uh, will then be able to perform those operations only. So we are now interacting directly uh, with the database in terms of the uh, authorized operation. So how is it uh, represented in reality? So this is the network policy that Authorize will create from the first line. So again, network policies, as opposed to client intent, um, are focused on the server side, right? So this is why here in the pod selector, this is the DB uh, that is selected. So this is applied to DB. It's like a firewall. So the firewall is applied on DB and only the pod with the label uh, intent.authorize.com access DB uh, to true will be allowed to talk to the database. So of course, what Authorize will do is label the analysis service with that particular label here. And then for every other service that needs to uh, access the database, we will apply that particular label. This is how we can uh, automate all the network policies. And then for the database, um, we are doing a couple of things. So first, authorize when you have the database integration, authorize will create a secret with a username and password uh, for that integration. And of course, the service or the container or the application, if you wish, that uh, needs to talk to the database. So the analysis service in our case will need to reference that particular secret to talk to the database. That's the first phase. And then the second phase, as I said, we are, uh, you know, in terms of the authorized operator is directly interacting and configuring the database to allow those specific, uh, those specific operation for the particular user that is specified 
within the secret. And Authorize will also um, automatically rotate uh, the secret and restart the container uh, when required. So let's move on to another example, this time involving cloud resources, and then we'll talk about uh, how to do it with Istio, and also we'll show you a demo on how to do it. So this is a bit more uh, complex application where we have different components. So we're going to be centered around the joke worker. Uh, so this is a that jokes uh, generator where the joke worker needs to talk to a Redis cache, a uh, NAT message, uh, NAT's message queuing, uh, talk to the internet to be able to access AWS, uh, STS service, uh, to assume a particular role and to get the permission to write uh, and read, of course, to a um, database, a Dymo DB database. Uh, the name of the table is jokes table. So let's take a look at uh, what sort of client intent we can work with. And as I, as I said earlier, this client intent can be automatically generated for you, or you can create it manually. Same thing with the database example before. We can also generate the required um, you know, table or database operations that um, you know, are aligned with the least privileged uh, principles, which is the most important part. So here again, we are centered around uh, the joke worker. So the joke worker is the client, the calling service. First, we want to call Redis, which is again a Kubernetes service. So uh, we're going to generate a network policies with that line. Then name NATS. We need to access NATS. And again, you know, a network policy will be generated. Um, then we also need to access an AWS resource in that particular case. So we create a new line, a new entry with type AWS. In the name, this will be the ARN, so the identity uh, of the resource that we want to interact with. So in that case, it's the jokes table and a list of uh, permissions we need for the joke worker. So here it's a bad example. It's just a white card, meaning every permission all permission uh, you know, possible. Uh, it's a bad practice, but it's just, just for the sake of demonstration because it would have, you know, go over the widths of the screen anyway. So as soon as you do this in the client intent, when you deploy it into your Kubernetes environment as a custom resource, we're going to automate, you know, again, the network policies, but that in that particular case, we're going to also create automatically the appropriate IAM roles and permissions in AWS um, you know, as you deploy the application. So again, the goal is to reduce human errors and to be able to scale a lot better and also to apply, you know, GitOps principle by storing this file, um, you know, collocated with your code or, um, you know, within a uh, infrastructure as code repository for your platform engineer to, um, to maintain all the DevOps um, uh, people to include into your continuous integration pipelines, right? And finally, we also have the internet intents here. So the internet intents allows you to specify a list of domain, or again, it can be automatically detected for you, um, to allow traffic to. So it allows you to implement a deny all egress policy, meaning that you, you can't get out of the cluster unless you specifically define a list of um, you know, URL you can access from your cluster. So in our particular case, we want to access the um, API from OpenAI to generate the dat jokes. We want to access, of course, our DynamoDB um, API in uh, our particular region. And we also want to access our STS service to be able to assume the role that we have uh, created uh, using the type AWS, right? So again, these domain names, because network policies, they don't support domain names. So again, this is going to be uh, translated into network policy, but we are going to look at those URL and resolve them into IP addresses. And if you have a load balancer, you know, or anything on, um, you know, fronting that particular uh, URLs, then we will update every couple of seconds. So the IP addresses are always uh, current. So finally, let's take a look at Istio um, as an example and see what it can 
add on top of um, the table as well. So, so far we've seen network policies, uh, database permissions, uh, which are some sort of uh, micro segmentation, but network policies are limited to layer three and layer four, so uh, port and um, IP addresses. Well, Istio will add an extra layer of security by allowing us in the client intent to specify HTTP resources and methods. So one, I mean, a couple of layers on top of um, simple network policies. So again, this client intent, as an example here, can be automatically generated or crafted manually. So um, we have the online shop front end that needs to access shop order, shop cart, and the product pages. So if we specify type HTTP, uh, followed by HTTP resources path and method, um, we will configure automatically the Envoy proxy within you know, um, Istio environment for you. And we do this by interacting and automated, this time not network policies, but authorization policies in Istio. So authorization policies are a native capability of Istio and authorize will automate them if you specify type, uh, type HTTP. And in the same way, when the uh, shop front end needs to access cart, we can configure the same component, HTTP resource slash cart with the get method. And again, same thing with uh, product. So by doing this, you are um, basically improving your security posture by narrowing down the calls that the different services can make. Um, and again, it applies least privilege principle and allow you to implement and deploy zero trust within uh, your environment. Okay, that was the last um, part I wanted to show you, I mean, theoretically. So now let's move on uh, with a demo of uh, the Istio part. So let's switch. Um, here on the left, I've got uh, Authorized Cloud, and on the right, I've got my Kubernetes cluster. So Authorized Cloud, as I said, you know, Authorized is an open source project, and there's also a cloud element that can connect to your uh, cluster um, to visually represent um, you know, the traffic flows and extra information, as well as provide extra integration, such as you know, Slack, GitLab, GitHub, all those sorts of uh, you know, extra features. But again, you can create an account for free. Uh, the moment you want to run Motorized at scale with support, of course, uh, you would have to pay us <laughs> to support you, um, if that makes sense. Uh, but yeah, you can create an account for free if you want to test it out. And also you can install it with a cluster through Helm. So authorize here, you can see on um, at the bottom of K9S, uh, there is an authorized system namespace that is uh, that has been provisioned. And I've just used uh, Helm so I can maybe recall and uh, upgrade here, right? So you can add the authorize uh, repo and repo update give. Um, so here in that example, I've uh, integrated with AWS. So depending on what you want to do, there may be different options here, uh, but you, know, you can check the tutorials uh, for different integration if you want to test it, but it's just essentially using Helm, right? So back to authorized components. So Helm um, is gonna deploy authorize, which has um, three main components. I mean, four if you uh, also count the daemon set. So we have two operators, the credentials operators, as the name uh, you know, says, this one is made to create, uh, is, uh, is there to create credentials, um, you know, for AWS or for your databases, um, all this integration. The intents operator is there to reconcile um, and translate the high level, you know, client intent into lower level security domains. So this is the entity responsible for translating client intent into, uh, you know, network policies, into Istio authorization policy, etc. Then we have the uh, network mapper. So the network mapper is a deployment, it's not really an operator. Its role is to talk to the sniffer. So the sniffer is a daemon set uh, running uh, BPF as well as different, you know, DNS um, methods to 
gather TCP traffic uh, and DNS replies so that we can map out the flows uh, from your application. It's reporting from every node to the mapper, but because I'm running a single node cluster, there's only a single sniffer. So the sniffer reports to the mapper and the mapper can report back to uh, the authorized CLI or to authorized cloud. Um, so here on the left uh, in authorized cloud, you can see that all the arrows are red because I've got my online shop application and I didn't deploy any client intent yet. And also I've uh, here enable assume default deny for both network policy and Istio authorization policies. So that means that I'm assuming um, it's like uh, a simulation. I'm simulating a default deny. And of course, because I don't have anything, any policy created, my shop uh, front end, my front end wouldn't be um, able to talk to product card in uh, order. But in reality, I don't have such rules. You want to uh, apply a denial only when you're uh, sure that all the allowed traffic will go through. So let's move to the uh, namespace online shop just to reduce the visibility. And uh, let's check the log of the front-end application. So you can see here the front-end, its only role is um, to do a loop and just call out the other um, three services, cart, production, and order. So basically what I'm doing here, I'm generating traffic because I want to show you how to auto-generate those policies, the client intent. So as I've got this traffic um, you know, happening, uh, I can... Um, use authorized CLI, uh, the mapper. So mapper is because we are talking to the network mapper to list the different calls that are made uh, within that namespace. So we can see that we have the front end talking to cart, order, and product on um, those specific URL path as well as method specified. So here uh, we already have this communication happening by um, talking to Envoy. So Authorize is directly monitoring uh, Envoy uh, proxy. So monitoring those metrics and reporting it into the network mapper. Right. So this is the first thing. So the second thing we can do with Authorize, um, Authorize CLI, we can use the mapper to uh, kind of have the same visualization. So let's call in here, we keep the same. And here we're gonna remove an uh, online shop, All right? So now I can open this application and I can see the same sort of graph, right? So you don't have to have authorized cloud to be able to uh, monitor uh, the different uh, traffic pattern, All right? So this is the second thing I can do. Now I can also use authorized mapper to export the list of call from um, the online shop and essentially create the client intent, right? So you can see this is just, if I make it a bit bigger here, uh, everything, you can see exactly the same thing, but as client intent representation. So now I can just apply this directly into my Kubernetes cluster. But I just want to show you also that on the left here, without having to do this command, uh, if I click here on online shop, for example, I will see that uh, seen in discover traffic, but not declared in client intent. So I already have all those uh, detected, uh, you know, policies that you can also download here or just copy here as well and create your client intent file. All right, that's basically it. So what I want to do here now is directly, I'm going to be using the CLI, so the same command, I'm going to call it. And then I can pipe it into kubectl apply f and this. All right, so I should see in a moment here uh, in green, but what it does in reality now, if we monitor the client intent, we have nine seconds ago, a client intent that has been created. And the content, of course, is, you know, what the output of my uh, command from uh, authorized CLI. 
have applied that into the deployed this into the cluster and as a result if we uh, check what has been created i can check first network policies i can see that yeah network policies has been created uh, with the same syntax as i've mentioned before so we label all the required pod with true and um, we specify this into the network policy and again we create this at the server side on the server side not in the client side so opposite direction compared to client intent that's one thing and now the last thing i wanted to show you is also the authorization authorization policies that comes also as custom resource but uh, because I've got Istio installed. So same thing is quite recent. It's when uh, they've been created um, by the intents operator as I've deployed the client intent. So here again, if I check the card, for example, you can see rules from source principle, uh, service account front end to operations method get and the path and the matching labels. So again, you don't have to manage those low level details. The only thing that you have to manage as a developer or as a platform engineer is the client intent, All right? So you can collocate this with your code and use GitOps to deploy it into your staging, into your testing environment, shifting left security, and then you can be sure that it's gonna behave exactly in the same way in production and you don't delay uh, security and um, policies from the security team because it also serves as a self-service documentation as we generate the policies, right? So it's effectively uh, simplifying the communication between all the teams by using software and custom resources in Kubernetes, things that have been there for uh, you know, as long as I can remember in Kubernetes since we um, had been starting with the operator framework. So now we can see on the left that, uh, just leave here that file, we can see on the left that uh, everything is green. Uh, we're happy if we have now uh, assumed default denial for both network policies uh, and Istio authorization policy, then our application will work properly and we have secured it. Okay, so that was it uh, for the demo. Uh, let's go back to the presentation just for a couple of uh, things to close uh, this talk. So hopefully this, this has been useful for you. You've maybe discovered a new way to implement security at scale. Don't hesitate to test it yourself. So um, here on the left, uh, you can use some self-paced labs if you want to discover authorized with that particular QR code. Or if you want to learn more about Istio in general and our Istio integration, just go to that QR code on the right. You will be directed to a long blog post I've uh, written describing you know, everything I've mentioned today and even more. And finally, if you want to ask me any question or have any questions around our features, or if you want to talk to our engineering or just want to connect with me, of course, you can do it via Strava or LinkedIn, or don't hesitate to join our uh, community Slack channel. So again, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. It was useful uh, that you have learned new things. And hopefully I will talk to you soon and I'll see you in the next one.